Second, second moment of area part two. What happens when the shape that we're trying to calculate is not a perfect rectangle, perfect triangle, or perfect circle? We have formulas for each of these. The rectangle is bh cubed on 12. The circle is pi d to the fourth on 64. A little bit different to j, which is pi to d to the fourth on 32. If it's in bending, it's pi d to the fourth on 64. And the triangle, which is bh cubed on 36 instead of 12. <coughs> All right, so that's great if you've got a rectangular, circular, or triangular beam. You can calculate the second moment of area. What happens if you get something which is a combination? A classic example of combination would be like an L shape. In that case, the rectangle formula doesn't work and you're not allowed to add them. You can't just do the second moment of area of this rectangle plus the second moment of area of that rectangle. The reason is because they're not bending around the same axis, the same neutral plane. If they don't have the same neutral plane, you can't add them. You have to add them with a special formula which is called the um, parallel axis theorem. So we'll do that in a minute. But before we get into the parallel axis theorem, we have to know how to calculate the centroid. So if, if this was a beam shaped like this and it was in bending, this part in here will be under a lot of compression right at the very extreme there because the whole thing is bending around a centroid which is a little bit up. So there's the centroid of that rectangle, the centroid of that rectangle, and the centroid of the whole thing which is about there. So what is the centroid? Well, I've got a shape here. Imagine that was the cross-section of the beam. Centroid means the centre of the area. In, f in fact, if you make a plate out of the cross-section, it's the place where this balances. Let me try and balance this. All right, so I'm balancing my finger on this beam. So that, that point there is the centroid. So that's where I have my finger. If I put my finger in this point here, I'll balance the whole cross-section. That's the centroid. So that means just as much area on that side as there is on that side, and just as much area on that side as there is on that side. So it's the average of all the area. Uh, we have to first of all calculate the centroid of the cross-sectional shape, and then we're going to use this to determine how we add up our second moment of area to get the total second moment of area. So centroid is the first job. How do we calculate centroid? Here's the formula. It's given the symbol C, and it's the sum of all the area times Y over sum of all the areas. What does that mean? For the shape that we had, which was a simple combination of two rectangles like this, I'm trying to find the centroid where all of this would balance. So I need to know the area of each of these. So what I do is I give them numbers. That's number one, number two. Set up the axis at the very bottom of the job. So this would be my origin here. This is my x-axis and my y-axis. And now I've got to be careful the way I set this up. The centroid of each element is the center of a rectangle because rectangles are simple. The centroid is in the middle of the rectangle. Put some dimensions on here. Now, what does y mean? This y here means the distance the distance to the centroid of that particular element. So I've got two of them here. I've got one and two. So y is my distance from my axis. So that will be called y1, and this one will be y2. That's y2 there. So let's have a go at doing this formula. yc, yc is the sum. So I'm adding up all my area times ay. So let's work out my areas. My area for a1 will be 412 times 335, which is um, 138020. And area 2 is um, 203 times 130, which is... Two, six, three, nine, zero. <coughs> so it's area 1 times a y1 plus area 2 times y2 divided by the sum of all the areas, area 1 plus area 2. 
That's what that means. That's what that equation means. The sum of all the area times y's. So that's the area 1 times y1, area 2 times y2, divided by the sum of all the areas. The sum of all the areas is area 1 plus area 2. Now the sum of all the area ay's at the top ends up being 419, huge number. And the sum of all the areas at the bottom, which is when we divide those two, uh, we end up with 255 millimetres. All right, so you can, you can see all the working here. We end up with 255 millimetres. Now, the middle of this one was at h half of 412, which is what, 200 and 206 millimetres, so a little bit over 206. So it's a little bit above the middle of the first one. So this becomes the centroid of the whole shape. That's your main centroid. And we just found the centroid in the y direction. So this is called yc, the centroid of the entire combination of two shapes. And this is 255 millimetres. So that's operation step one. Find the centroid. So that's the same as finding what height this had to be on in order to balance. So I could balance this shape on my finger if I'm the right distance away from the bottom. So that would be YC. Right, I, when I did it with my finger, I also did another axis to find this dimension. We call that XC. So we repeat the entire process we just did then. We can repeat that in the X direction as well. If we wanted to find IXX and IYY, we'll need to find YC and YX. But if we're only doing IXX, we only have to find YC. If there's only a load from the top, we look at the neutral plane. We're trying to find where the neutral plane is, and that will be uh, calculated based on YC. Finding the centroid is our first step, and here we have for the calculation, we end up 255 millimetres. <coughs> what do we do with that? Right. Remember I said you're not allowed to add the second moments of area together because they don't have the n same neutral plane? Well, if you don't remember, I did. That's what I said. But using the parallel axis theorem, we take into account the different neutral planes. So this element has a neutral plane about there. This element has a neutral plane there. And the combination has a neutral plane there. So there's three possibilities. The neutral plane of each element is not going through the neutral plane of the other one. So we have to use the parallel axis theorem. The parallel axis theorem has an extra term here. This is your extra amount of second moment of area that you get because you're away from the neutral plane. Remember I said with a beam like this, they deliberately make as much area away from the neutral plane as possible. Why do they do that? Because it makes it stiffer. And what's happening is the area, the, the, um, the bending effect of this top plate. Imagine if I sliced this up. I took a cut right through there, and I've just got a piece of flat which is, what, 3 inches by 10 mil. That would be very weak. I, if I walked on that, it would just sag. I'll have two of those, uh, plus this, this one, uh, which is vertical. This one would be the strongest, because it would be vertical. But these would be very weak, because they're flat, laying down this way. But when I join them together, the whole, uh, situ the whole uh, combination is much stiffer than any of those three elements. So obviously, when I join the elements together, I'm increasing the effect of this top and bottom plate dramatically. That increase is that term there, AD squared. That is, area of this times the distance to the, the neutral plane, halfway, squared. So I'm adding this term, and that term ends up being a lot bigger than the um, second moment of area of the top flange. All right, so... D there is very important. This is the one that you've got to be very careful with. D needs to be defined very carefully. The distance Okay, the big long definition there is the distance from the neutral plane, combined neutral plane, 
to the element centroid. What do we mean by that? It has its own centroid. That's called the element centroid. There's the element centroid there, element 1 centroid, element 2 centroid. We know where they are. That's just the middle of the rectangles. Then there's the combined centroid, which is here. It's probably about there. And that's at 255 millimetres. Remember, we calculated that when we found the centroid. Okay, that's YC. What is D? D is the distance from, this is now the neutral plane because it's the centroid of the whole thing. This is called the neutral plane, and in our case it would be the XX plane. Neutral plane. What we do is we drop our original axes, our X and Y axes, forget them, and now we're going to base everything off the neutral plane. And D is my distance from the neutral plane to the element's axis. So we've got a D2 there, and a D1 there. So uh, D is my distance from the neutral plane, which we just found. We had to get the centroid to get the neutral plane. Once we got that, we now use that as our basis axis. And D is the distance from neutral plane to centroid, neutral plane to centroid. Now, I can calculate the real value of the second moment of area for the shape when it's trying to bend around a different axis. So I have to glue this together properly. It's not allowed to slip. And if I do, then this is trying to bend around there being neutral. So the whole thing's in compression. The whole of that block is in total compression. When that happens, for example, in this beam, if I had this plate by itself, it'll be compression at the top, tension at the bottom, just in this little piece here. But when it's joined together in one piece, the whole plate is in compression, and the whole plate at the bottom is in tension. That dramatically increases the second moment of area by taking its own centroid, B D cubed on 12, which is pretty low, and adding A D squared, area times distance squared. And that dramatically increases second moment of area. All right, so I1, the real value for I, uh, with this one, I1, is actually equal to its own second moment of area, I C1, plus A, the area of it, times D squared. We've set these up on a table, which makes it a lot easier to keep track of. Let's watch what's going on here. Um, we started off here and we found um, AY, AY divided by total A squared. So we get that divided by that equals that. We found the centroid. That's what we did before. Now, keep going. What else do we need? We're going to do an I1 and an I2. I1 will be that one, and I2 will be C2 plus A times D2 squared. Then we're allowed to add them. Once we put this extra term on, the parallel axis theorem term, then we're allowed to add I1 plus I2 to get the total. We're not allowed to add them unless we take the offset into account. So we get 195, whatever it is, billion or something um, for IC1 and only a bit sm quite a bit smaller for two, because this is a larger rectangle, so that has a big IC, that's got a smaller IC. Then the distances, this distance is uh, 49 here, uh, whereas this distance is 258. So that's going to have a, a, a lot bigger term in the AD squared because of that distance there. So this one adds an extra 336, but this one has a large area as well, times that distance. So it adds 100 and uh, that number there, 1.75 billion. And that gives us our total uh, for I1 being 0.5 million. And this one is 184. 2.2 billion versus 1.8 billion. So I2 is actually having a fair bit of effect on it because it's a long way away. So it amplifies the effect of this little bit here. It's making it quite a lot stronger. Now we're allowed to add them. So we can add those two together and we end up with uh, 4137 million. And the units are millimetres to the power of four. All right, so that's the procedure when we're uh, doing the second moment of area for a, a uh, combined shape. We have to First of all, find the centroid, and then we base our whole axis system on that new centroid, 
and we apply the parallel axis theorem. Once we apply this to each element, we can then add them together. We find it's usually much easier to do it in a table because we can keep track of all, all your data. Plus, of course, once you work out area over here, you can apply it. Multiply area times d squared. Y you've already calculated area. So it's perfectly suited for Excel. All right, so uh, I'll just whiz through some of the examples in here. You can also have a single shape by itself bent around another axis. Of course, you can't actually do that unless something holds it out there. For example, on here, we're holding two pieces of wood apart by uh, putting a piece of wood in between, making a, a basically an I-beam. <coughs> the other thing is it's very important that the, the, uh, the beam stays together. You can't have two separate parts that slide. As soon as they slide, you've lost your second moment of area advantage. So, for example, with a laminated beam like this, these, um, each layer has to be, each lamination has to be glued because if it slips, they're no longer a beam that deep. It, wherever it slips, now it's two beams of this depth. Uh, for example, if you're having leaf springs in this car, um, it's not the same as a beam that thick. It's only four times a beam of this thick. So if you double the, double the depth of a beam, it's to power three, so that's eight times as stiff. But if you have two beams and you cut them in half, it's only twice as stiff. So every time you increase the depth, because it's to the power of 3, BD cubed on 12, remember? Uh, there it is there, BH cubed on 12. So it's double the depth, 8 times as stiff. For a comparison, we've got a leaf spring here uh, as a composite, a single part. And uh, it's even though it's a lot less stiff, it's only uh, fiberglass, it's very much thinner because it's a single piece rather than multiple pieces. Now I'm going to show you some cheats. We've got ourselves an I-beam here, and we have to do three different elements. We've got the top element, the middle element, and the bottom element. We have to find the centroid of the whole thing. The whole thing's symmetrical, so if you did find the centroid, you find it goes right through the center. So that saves a bit of time. But then we set up our table, and we have to have I1, and then distance 1 is distance 2. And uh, this squared times the area, da-da-da, use the parallel axis theorem, and add one, two, three elements. Or... Remember, the rule for the parallel axis theorem is you have to use it if the elements don't have the same neutral plane. If you can cut it up so that they do have the same neutral plane, you don't have to use the parallel axis theorem, and you don't have to find the centroid. So, for example, I could, instead of adding one, two, three parts together, I could start with a big rectangle and subtract two holes, and all of them have the same neutral plane, because it's all in the middle. So it'd be like this, an I-beam equals a big rectangle minus two holes. Each of those are BH cubed on 12. So I just go BH cubed on 12 minus two times BH cubed on 12. And I uh, get my answer quite quickly there, 18,000. Yep, yeah, that's a good question. In real life, we have little quarter circles in here with those fillets. And... Uh, there's a little bit of radiuses elsewhere. Um, they take those into account in the calculations you get on in tables, and you'll find that these are slightly higher than the one that you would calculate because you're getting extra ben, uh, second moment of area from that. You could take that into account as well. You've, you've, got, a, you've got an extra element there, which you'd have to uh, element three, which is a bit of a pain. But you'll get close something with a hollow, you just do the outside and subtract the inside if it's symmetrical in the y direction, and circular one's the same. So pipes are a simple case of outside, subtract the inside. What about this one? Would we be needing to do the parallel axis theorem for our IXX here? Is there any way to cut away a hole that has the same neutral plane as the combined neutral plane? Unfortunately, in a vertical, if we're trying to find IXX, there's no simple solution. We have to s use our parallel axis theorem. We've got two parts, and we'll have to work out the centroid, uh, then add those two um, with their parallel axis theorem terms, AD squared. So no shortcuts on that one. What about this one, an L shape? Can we uh, do this simply, or we need to parallel axis theorem this one as well? 
Okay, it's not symmetrical in the y-axis, so that means we have to use parallel theorem, parallel axis. Also, in the x-direction, we'd have, we'd have the same problem. We'd have to do parallel axis theorem again in both ways. Most of the time, we're looking for ixx, which means we've got the force coming from the top. The force is from the top, we're after ixx, so we need to find the y-centroid. Get that. All right, so let me just do a quick summary of how we get the second moment of area for a combined shape. The first thing we do is we need to find the centroid. We use our centroid formula, sum of ay's divided by sum of a's, and we get my y centroid dimension. Then we start the question over again, this time doing everything based on the centroidal axis, the neutral plane. <coughs> Using the neutral plane, we then apply the parallel axis theorem, which is the second moment of area for an element equals its own second moment of area plus the a d squared term, where d is the distance from the neutral plane to its own centroid. Then we can add them together to get the total. That's it.